I really, I said on Friday that I would have preferred that the Knicks played the Pacers. And I think that that sort of was a consensus among most Knicks fans. Like, all right, forget about this whole, it's us against the world, Tommy Lugauer, dudes, dogs, damage. Mm. Let's just take a look at this from a standpoint of what's the best matchup for them. And it, even though Indiana can score a ton, it was just, that's a better matchup. The Knicks are tougher. They play better defense. That just, to me, felt like if you're going to get out of the first round in five games, that would be the better matchup. So now they are got a very good chance of meeting the Philadelphia 76ers or the Miami Heat when getting the two seed, coming back, beating the Bulls in overtime. And the way that Tom Thibodeau reacted after the game when he was talking to the media, when he was asked about, did you think about taking the foot off the gas pedal? It was The reaction that he gave facially and his answer was like, are you guys kidding me? And, and that's what made me feel better about it. It was like, these guys don't care who they play. Mm-hmm. And they're confident in who they are, what they are. They give your classic, uh, you can only control what you can control. And winning that game in front of that home crowd to end the season with 50 wins was a statement. It was a message that they don't care. Wherever they're ending up, they're going to take on all comers and forget about if it's the 76ers or the Heat in the first round or the Pacers, that whatever matchup it is, they're going to take it on and they're going to win. That's the way I felt. Now, I don't love if it ends up being the Miami Heat and you're just grinding and grinding and grinding and grinding through that series in the first round. I don't think that helps set you up for success as you go on deeper into the playoffs, but screw it. I mean, this team, you want to talk about unkillable. That's what they have been this year more than any other team in New York sports so far. We'll see what happens with the Rangers. But this was awesome yesterday, and it got me so jacked up for next weekend to see who they end up playing. Obviously, we'll find out this week and start in this first-round series. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a a lot of different ways you can look at this. One being kind of like what people think Cleveland might have done, taking their foot off the gas. Uh, Perhaps. I'm I'm not sure. I didn't watch that game, but I've seen the stories. Here's what I know about the Knicks. Mm -hmm. This team has taken a couple of punches this season, and they have bounced back every time. Even when they they, they lost the guys they lost, and you found out Randall was done for the season, and, you know, they were dealing with Ananobi not back yet. You're thinking, hang on to six. Just don't get to that play-in scenario. And not only did they only did they hang on to six, they finished second. They come up with 50 wins. The Garden's electric. Yesterday was, I mean, you're watching that game. They're down eight points in the fourth quarter. They had every chance where every guy out there could have said, ah, you know what, we gave it a good run. Let's get ready for the postseason. And instead, you got Dante DiVincenzo playing 53 minutes. Mm. They only played 53 minutes with the overtime. I think he only sat for like 30 seconds or so. Um, and they made big play after big play, and I will continue to say what I've said all season long, and that is Jalen Brunson is an absolute superstar. And even when, I know he had 40 yesterday, but it's the plays he made when he didn't score that is what I marvel at, and he makes this team better. And the other thing about this team is what, you know, Carmelo was a great scorer. I'm not, I don't mean to have a Carmelo conversation, but what, what did we complain about during the Carmelo years? The ball just stuck. There was no free-flowing offense. The way these guys move the ball and they seem to know where everybody's at, I don't, yeah, I don't think facing Joel Embiid is a great matchup if he's even healthy. I'm not even sure what his status is coming back from the surgery. Um, That having been said, you're the two seed, you're the Knicks. They should be concerned about playing you. I agree with the whole heat premise that they might grind you out for six games. I think the Knicks are the better team. And I actually believe whether it's five games, six games, seven games, I think you're better for it going forward. And to me, I wouldn't fear anybody if I was this Nick team. Yeah, and he, Embiid, missed the last game uh, against the Nets, I believe. But those other two games prior to that, that he was scoring over 30 points. Mm-hmm. He was looking like himself. And I think that was more of a maintenance situation than anything, him missing the game. I don't think it was a re-injuring or a soreness or whatever. Um, so he, you got to expect him to be ready to go. You just, you just have to, and to be great. Now the Knicks, the one guy that they really kind of were careful with yesterday was Mitchell Robinson. Yeah, barely played. Yeah. So that, and that to me was almost like, all right, we're going to need him more than anybody. For if sure. we play the 76 ers so let's make sure that he's ready to go. He doesn't re-injure anything and he's as healthy as possible. So they, I, I've never been. In, in this season of ups and downs and who was healthy, who was not, the only other time I was more confident in the Knicks than I am right now is when they went on that initial run after the Ananobi trade and Randall was still healthy. Yeah, they were like the best team in the league for a couple weeks. That was the only other time. Right now, I'm not quite as confident as I was then, but it's close. I mean, if I was a 10 out of 10 then, I'm a 9 out of 10 now. 
And and not to say that that Julius Randle being off of this team for the postseason is going to completely sink them. I, I do think that they they'd be the best version of themselves with him healthy. But I I still think they there there isn't a team in the Eastern Conference that is head and shoulders better than the New York Knicks. And it's 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 never I I haven't said that in a long time since Jordan left to play mm-hmm. baseball. Yeah. You're going uh, way honestly. Back. Yeah, I I understand. I mean that there is not. I mean, I know the Celtics record wise are better than the Knicks, thirteen games, whatever it is. But we know that they're not that much better than the New York Knicks. I mean, they, they would be the Celtics would be favored, but it wouldn't be this massive favorite in the yeah. series if they met each other in the playoffs. You've got to give them credit. The, you know, we always talk about you know putting pieces together, and and perhaps it's the college connection, whatever it is. This group of players. They seem to enjoy playing with one another. It goes to what I said before. It seems like one knows where the other is going to be. There was one fast break yesterday. I think it ended with a Bogdanovich three. So that has nothing to do with the college connection I was talking about. But just in terms of the cohesiveness of this club, there was one. There was a, I don't know if it was a Chua or Ananobi had a rebound on the one side, one pass, second pass, all in rhythm. And Bogdanovich just drills the three. And the place, it sounded like the roof was going to was yeah. gonna pop off yeah. the garden. And that... It's just one play in a, in a, in a two-and-a-half-hour game and a long list of plays. I just said, my God, that was a thing of beauty. And it was part – I think it might have tied the game. Maybe it put them up one. I think it was somewhere in the middle of the fourth quarter. But it's just you watch them. And as I've said to you, and it's easier to do this when Boomer's not here, um, it's a very likable group. I mean, ah. if I was a Nick fan, I would love this team. And it starts from the head down and that uh, – the top down. And that guy is Jalen Brunson. I don't know how – you don't root for a guy like this. He's just, even the shot at the end of regulation where he could have won the game, he's falling out of bounds. He's being double teamed and he almost got the damn thing to go. Yeah. I mean, he's just, he's an electric player and he makes everybody better. And think about too, <clears throat> the game against the Nets and storming back as well. What was that Friday night? <clears throat> I mean, how, how great was to see them not give up in that game too. I mean, I got a couple of tweets of people going, oh, let down spot. You know, they're putting sure. their feet up, all this stuff. They come storming back. They do it again last night. And of course, yeah, I mean, it's Jalen Brunson's gotten to that territory now where he's so consistently good all the time. It's it's almost boring talking about it. It's yeah. not boring watching him. It's it's when, when Derek Jeter was an automatic every single year at that portion of his career. Mm-hmm. It's almost like you forgot to mention how good he was every day because you just knew he was going to be that good every day. Yep. And that's where Jalen Brunson has has fallen into. Now, if he ends up getting the job done, well, Mike Breen just said it the other day. He's like, this is the most important point guard the Knicks have had since a, a guy named Clyde. Clyde. You yeah, know, I don't he know. Said it, said it to Clyde. Can't argue it. Yeah, I mean. And it's not even close at this point. And you talk about a guy that just goes out there and does his job. He's everything you love. You know, whether it was the Derek Jeters of the world, the Barry Sanders. It's not flashy. Not that those guys aren't fun to watch. But it's just a very business-like approach. And then I watch that podcast with him and Josh Hart almost every – well, there's only been three or four episodes, but I've seen them. He's just likable. He just seems like a good dude who's really good at what he does. And I, that's uh, the other thing, too. I said this two months ago when Evan mocked me for it. The idea that when you look at the MVP odds that he's not on that front page in the top four or five to me was ridiculous. When you looked it up, he didn't even show yeah. up. Yep. Now you look at what he's done to this team and where they'd be without him, they'd be nowhere. I know they're still a, they'd still be a, a decent team, but they wouldn't be this. No, and I don't know how much it's changed. I mean, it's tough, though, when there's a guy who's such a lock like Joe Kitchen. Understood. It, it's but just it doesn't of- mean he's not in the conversation, and he should be. Yeah, I I, know. I agree. But so, yeah, it's still it's still ridiculous. But I mean, I don't think it really reflects his candidacy when you so he's he's fourth on the list now. Okay, so that but that's significant movement to the perception of him and the way he's played, because when you looked at this about seven, eight weeks ago when we did a show, he didn't even show up on the sheet. Right. Yep. So he is. So you got you got Jokic at minus sixty six hundred which is insane. So yep. if people don't understand what that means, you got to put up $6,600 to win 100. Right. Uh Luka Doncic plus 1600. 
SGA, Shea Gilgis Alexander at plus 3,000. Who doesn't get enough credit because of where he plays for what he's done? Right. And then Jalen Brunson, fourth on the list yeah. at uh, 12 plus 12,500. But to me, that's one of those things where, you know, when, when people uh, get nominated for awards, it's like, oh, it's just a, it's an honor to be nominated. Yeah. They yeah. wanted to win. I do believe in a case like this, it really is an honor to be in the conversation. I, you always want to win. But to sit there and say that you might have finished third or fourth in the MVP vote. I do think that means something. Oh, yeah. I mean, especially if you're a New York Nick. 100%. I mean, and, and the, the Carmelo Nick fans, the younger Carmelo Nick fans that absolutely loved him. And as you said before, I'm not trying to open up a discussion about Carmelo Anthony, but it was different. I mean, he was a scorer. He was a star. But you never felt like he had the ability to take this team to the place that we all wanted to see them go. And the other reason was, too, that during that time, you know, the Miami Heat had a, in his prime, LeBron James yeah. paired up with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. And that team was unbelievable. You just knew they weren't going to, like, tell me the team in the East now that you know the Knicks can't beat. There isn't one. There isn't, no, there isn't one. I agree. I think beating the Celtics would be a challenge, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Like, I wouldn't be stunned if they actually won a grueling seven-game series against Boston. I wouldn't be. Yeah, absolutely not. So they end up with 50 wins. They end up with the two seed. It really is amazing. At the two seed, and they're 14 games back of the Celtics. Well, that's the difference. You look at the West and the East, how different it is in terms of records. And then, you know, the teams that are, I think, I think Phoenix is sixth, I want to say. Maybe a sixth, something like that. But you look at the teams that uh, that are towards the bottom part, and they're just so good. There's so little that uh, differentiates, whereas Boston is so far ahead of everybody here. Yeah. I mean, and you, you really... Like, the Bucks are a mess, as we know. The yeah. Cavaliers are not a threat. The Magic have played the Knicks tough the entire year, but still, they're the Orlando Magic. They're still not quite there yet, you wouldn't think, to make that big run. The Pacers are a great scoring team, not worried about them. And really, it's going to come down to what team are you, what Sixers and Heat team are you going to get? That's going to define this postseason in the Eastern Conference more than anything. I'll tell you, too, if you get a, a scenario where, and I know a lot of people have ripped the, the regular season to shreds, and, and I, I've understood that for years. I mean, it certainly is. It's a long season, and then you get teams. Recently, you saw the Heat last year come out of the play-in tournament, go all the way to the finals. The one thing about the Knicks that's different to me, about, for most teams, there are some that play defense, but they seem to play for 48 minutes every night. They defend every night. Um, I, now you're going to see teams that basically go through the motions and try to outscore you all season now try to defend. Then it'll be interesting to see those teams in the lower tier that make the play-in or the playoffs, uh, you know, the 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 teams. Who turns it up a notch like the Heat do last year? Because if we see another play-in team yeah. have one of these runs, the re like what does that do? to the regular season going forward. Like, what does it mean? It's well, almost like, let's just have a big tournament every year. Because that's what it feels like. Yeah, I mean, and this is the problem, I think, with most pro sports these days is the fact that they've got no way to figure out a way to supplement and get the amount of money they still get by cutting regular season games because they have to play as many and they count on that money and the buildings and the concessions and all this stuff and the TV, which selling 82 regular season games. We're selling 162 regular season games, so they don't know how to, to to figure out a different way to package it and get the same amount of return financially. But every year that goes by, it feels like these regular seasons are less and less important. Yeah, and you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. If you and, and then obviously you're never going back to the way it was. But if you think about baseball back in the day, if you only took the division winners and everybody else was out, well then you have two thirds of the the entire baseball league out of it by July. That's not good for anybody. But then on the other side of the coin is if you expand the playoffs and you let more teams in, all of a sudden teams, they get to a specific spot. They can kind of coast. They know when they get to the postseason, they can turn it on. Well, then what did the regular season mean? There's really, you got it. I don't know where the right answer is, but right now it ain't great. Right. And then the Rangers still have an opportunity to win the president's trophy, meaning the most points in the NHL regular season. And that means that they'll lose in the first round, <laughs> as we know. They're not going to lose in the first round. Mm -hmm. If this team they loses still have in the a chance first to play round, the Islanders, and that was one hell of a game oh, on hey, I, I know. Saturday. And that would be a hell of a series. I'm telling you, though, if I, everything I've ever thought about sports, and I guess you could say that with the Bruins, obviously, last year, too, though, but watching this Ranger team all season long. God, if this team doesn't make a deep run, I'm never watching again. Yeah, but I mean, hockey is so different. I understand, but, they, but the difference to me is they have the goalie. 
This isn't but just he hasn't been great team. though. Well, he hasn't been the, the yes and no. Vesna guy that he was a couple yes years no. ago. He's had some games where he hasn't been great. He also had, he just, you go back three weeks ago, he had a stretch of seven or eight games. He was the best player in the league again, or the best goalie in the league. So he's capable of it. This isn't one of these teams that's been really good all year, and you just kind of hope that you get good goaltending. Yeah. You expected from him.